recognize um, two guests uh, here. John Englander has joined us and we're very honored to have him here. Uh, he's an oceanographer, an expert on sea level rise and has uh, his second edition of his highly acclaimed book is called High Tide on Main Street, Rising Sea Level and the Coming Coastal Crisis that explains the science behind climate change and sea level rise. Uh, we also have Tim Whitehouse, Executive Director of Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, which is an organization that supports public employees in the environmental field to ensure accountability and prevent wrongdoing. Um, Richard Emery is, has a very long, varied and influential career focused on combating environmental pollution. He graduated from Yale and Harvard Law he clerked for the Chief Judge of Maryland, served in the Maryland Legislature, became Assistant Attorney General to the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and went on to serve a long and distinguished career in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, including as its Chief and Criminal Investigator. His new book is Fighting Pollution and Climate Change, and I'm holding the cover up so you can see. Um, and uh, it's a memoir of his interesting life and a guide to pollution and climate change, how we got here, what is going on, and what we can do to stave off disaster. So join me in welcoming him. I'm sorry that um, uh, we can't see him, but I, I hopefully will be able to hear you. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, Richard, are you there? <laughs> hopefully. Okay. Can you hear him okay? No. Uh, oh. Uh, give, me the, give, give me the meeting ID one more time. I'm going to try one more time while I'm talking. Okay. Can you hear him now? Yes. Now they can hear you, so go ahead. Well, give me the meeting ID one more time, and I'll be hopefully talking, but I just want to type that in too. Okay. Uh, the, the meeting number was 864-9779. Seven two zero three. Okay. Okay. Well, hello everybody, and uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie and Monica, for making this possible. And uh, what happened? Can hear. Monica, you're on mute. I've seen a lot of what humanity is doing to devastate our little planet. And uh, I want to give you four clear takeaways covered by my book. I'm leaving some time for Q&A if you all still have the patience for that. Uh, am I being heard okay? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Well, takeaway number one. Um, since uh, about 500 million years ago, when life on Earth began, there have been five mass extinction events, all caused by natural climate change. And we're now in the middle of the sixth extinction, which is the first man-made extinction. And since we are our planet's most invasive species, uh, we're displacing and killing off many other species that are rate up to a thousand times the natural rate. So we have to start here, and, and the first chapter of my book is entitled Extinctions Past and Present. Uh, now, uh, there was a booklet that went out with the meeting announcement, and I, I want to mention, first of all, another book uh, that I highly recommend is by Elizabeth Colbert. She writes for the New Yorker, The Sixth Extinction and Unnatural History. And it's just a perfect book. Uh, uh, particularly, I suppose, a woman's book club because she uh, alone, as far as I know, uh, and bravely visits the world's most remote scientific outposts. I'm talking about the Amazon, Antarctic, uh, uh, Pacific atolls, and she shows up and she says, Hi, I'm Elizabeth Colbert, New Yorker Magazine. I'll be here for two weeks uh, to take me out and take me sampling and get me money and show me your labs. And Tell me everything you're finding, and I'll write it up in a book. 
And so they do. And, and each chapter is a varied and true adventure story as well as a science story. And the architecture of her book tried to, it was teaching me to try to make my book in the same way. Uh, so you will find in my book uh, some hard environmental science written by me, a non-scientist, like she's a non-scientist when she wrote her book, but written for the non-scientist. But we combine it with plenty of storytelling to make uh, books entertaining and enlighten the dire findings of science. Uh, so in my book, you will find uh, adventures, including some of my true detective stories, the criminal investigations. And by the way, I was not EPA's chief criminal investigator. I was the legal advisor for the patients, uh, 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 EPA special agents who are the criminal investigators. But only briefly, uh, because of, of something quite terrible that happened to me, does anybody know the name Bill Barr? I'm sure you all do. Uh, Bill Barr was Attorney General when I was EPA's top criminal lawyer. And uh, in those years, uh, in the early 1990s, uh, uh, when Poppy Bush was the president, uh, DOJ was always making sweetheart deals, giving away EPA's cases, but well, punishing the bad guys, uh, just like we've seen today in the paper. Uh, so uh, I became, uh, as EPA's top criminal lawyer, I became a reluctant principal. Of course, I tell the story of that in my book. Uh, that was too much of an adventure. That was too exciting. <laughs> and much more fun are the stories of my foreign assignments uh, when EPA sent me to resign in Paris and, and be a professor, a law professor in Germany. And, and, and you will find these chapters interspersed with the hard science. And I hope you'll be as entertained as my wife and I were uh, to learn uh, how history and politics and culture and daily rituals and national attitudes affect environmental protection and how in Western Europe they often do it much better than we do here in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Uh, Richard, much more, uh, yes. Richard, I'm going to interrupt you. Um, we're going to yes. try one other thing. I'm going okay. to I'm going to hang up and try dialing this number. It's three no, one. You want, you want me to you want me to dial this number? Yes, it's the number is three one two six two six six seven nine nine. All right, I'll hang up and dial that number. Okay, see if that helps, if that works. But well, my computer is still on, so. That's okay. Right. right. I had a little distortion in his voice. Yeah, it's hard this way. It was, it was too, it was difficult. Um, Monica, somebody, uh, Janelle sent me a link to a, a way of calling in also, but I guess if he can call in with your number, it might. Yeah, this is a number that Margie gave me. Oh, okay. There are several numbers you can use. Yeah, see, there's no numbers that show up on my end. Uh, Monica, someone suggested maybe his wife could open uh, could do on her own computer if she's there. I don't know. If she's registered. Have him, but yeah, have her register. So what happened? He's not calling. It looks like there's a 954 number on the line. I don't know if you have to call me, but it's going to be needed. That's him. 
Is it's, it? It's uh, the meeting. It's, it's six, six, four. Nine, seven, seven, nine. Seven, eight, four. work he just needed the um, meeting ID number thanks for the work okay so so for everybody the one thing we've learned is that <laughs> when we do meetings via registration don't share your link it truly is just for you looks it looks like he's here now yeah okay can we hear it you see him no. we we can only see his phone we can't we don't see him i don't see his phone number oh there it is am i uh richard we have you no. you can see me no we we can hear you though Oh, oh, you couldn't hear me before. Uh, well, shall I just keep talking or am I going to? No, you, I'm, sound, I'm not gonna, you sound good now. <laughs> oh, I sound better. Okay, it's a, be it's a better phone thing. Much All right. Better. Okay. All right. Well, well uh, anyway, I was thanking Elizabeth Colbert for showing me her, tea, her technique of, of yin and yang and sweet and sour. But let, let's go back now to the dismal science and conclude your takeaway number one. And the point is this. Uh, if we the people continue polluting the air with business as usual, burning fossil fuels and emitting other man-made climate killing chemicals, in about 200 years, humanity will be joining in the sixth extinction that today we are imposing on so many other species. Uh, for the book on this, uh, for the scientific dynamics of past and future climate extinctions, the second book on my list for you was Peter D. Ward's book. It's a title, it's a long title, Under a Green Sky. Um, and the subtext of the title is Global Warming, the Mass Extinctions of the Past, and what they can tell us about our future. And based on this geologic record that he well describes, there's no reason to think that if we continue business as usual, burning fossil fuels, there's no reason to think that Earth's future will not be like past extinctions, all caused by climate change from uh, too much CO2. So after my talk, if you have time and there's a question about it, we can go into the science of this in some more detail. Your second takeaway is this. Uh, during the lives of our grandchildren, or certainly our great-great-grandchildren, Everyday street flooding will be so bad as to shut down our seaports and cause our descendants to begin the process of abandoning vast coastal areas in all our major cities at sea level. In this century, catastrophic ocean flooding is now inevitable, you might say, baked in. And it's too late to prevent the loss of much of Florida. And if we continue with business as usual, we will lose most of Florida in the 22nd century and the sea will go hundreds of miles up the Mississippi River. Now, this prediction is also based on the geologic record. And again, there's no reason to think that science, there's no scientific reason to think that the sea will not rise again 65 to 85 feet, just as in the past it has been at this level with 417 parts per million of CO2 in the air, that what we have today. And, and, uh, you know the TV salesman who sells the uh, magic mops and the sticky tape and such? Well, but like him, I'll just say to you this. But wait, there's more. It's not just CO2 from fossil fuels. We're also poisoning the air with other greenhouse gases. I'm talking about unburned leaking methane, which is natural gas, nitrous oxides from industrialized farming, and man-made refrigerants and propellants. And the rate that we're doing this is accelerating. Uh, and uh, Monica, can you, can you now put the camera on my friend John Englander uh, while I'm talking? Um, are you showing John? 
Hello? Monica, Hello? you're I'm looking for him. Oh, well, okay. Well, anyway, I'll just tell you, uh, you all probably know John because he lives in Boca, uh, and you, you uh, may know him as a, a famous oceanographer. Uh, he worked briefly for the Custod Society. Tell me if you have him, have him up on the screen. Um, he may have given up on this. <laughs> but he may have. I, I, I'm not seeing his name here now. Well, he he probably, he probably because of my fooling around with Zoom, he, he 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 gave up on us. But I want to tell you, he's written a wonderful book on this. It's very readable, and it's the second. Uh, actually, it's, I think my third book recommendation is called High Tide on Main Street: uh, Rising Sea Level and the Coming Coastal Crisis. And he's also written another book that carries it carries us into the future, and I think is basically addressing the uh, some of the very very difficult topics of how do we how do we abandon the coastline in, in an orderly fashion and I don't know the title of his of his next book but it's it's in the works well the only question is the exact timing of this disastrous sea level rise and chances are it'll be coming sooner rather than later uh, because we're approaching some tipping points uh, uh, that may occur anytime and maybe soon uh, Europeans call these black swans if you, if, I don't know if you heard that expression but it's a rare unforeseen yet very extreme or consequential coming of an event <laughs> that nobody thought would come but there it is a black swan uh, a tipping point and after my talk I can tell you what some of these tipping points might be that could bring sea level rise on very quickly um, well, are you thoroughly depressed yet? Um, well, if so, here's some good news. In two parts, we have the yin and yang here. Uh, part one is my generation will be dead just before this happens. Uh, and I suppose it's not fair that we will not have to suffer the chaos we made for our descendants, but uh, at least my generation will be dead. Uh, part two of the good news is that this devastating flooding will probably come soon enough that our grandchildren and their children should wake up walking in the ocean water on their city streets and have just enough time to stop burning fossil fuels and prevent human extinction. So it will be a squeaker or a narrow escape, but I think we can realistically hope for some human survival. Uh, this is the good news, and we already see smart young people marching in the streets. Um, look at Greta Thunberg as the most startling example, uh, jolting the world with straight talk that most in adults are incapable of. And some of us may have green grandchildren asking us, what have we done to their inheritance of the planet? So I am hopeful that our grandchildren will have just enough time to stop business as usual and save their grandchildren, who would be our great-great-grandchildren, and that human humanity will survive. All right, only two more takeaways, and here's your third one. And it's more bad news. Uh, today, our ignorance and greed, making money from fossil fuels, continues to spiral out of control. And the most recent gun that we put to our head is hydraulic fracturing for methane, also known as natural gas, uh, to replace coal. And while this is falsely advertised as clean energy, in fact, fugitive or escaping an unburned natural gas is a far more powerful molecule than CO2 in, in its climate killing effect. So uh, the leaking methane is, is destroying the climate at roughly three to six times faster than if we were burning coal. And to make matters worse, it's shocking to me that here in Florida, it is a push by our state government and the electrical utilities to bring more natural gas into our state. Um, and, and the inescapable fact is that the proponents of natural gas are speeding the drowning and disappearance forever of the Florida they say they want to protect. And um, also worth noting and being wary of is that a few of our top and self-described conservation or clean water organizations are keeping quiet about the air pollution destroying the climate. And they don't see that by keeping quiet, they're acquiescing in the suicide pact for drowning Florida. 
maybe maybe they've been improperly influenced by uh, large donations of money from natural gas interests. So some of them have been. Uh, so here again, after my talk, uh, if there's a question about it, we can go into the details of this massive leadership failure in Florida, and you might want to ask me about Florida Power and Light. Okay, I'm coming to the fourth and last takeaway. Are we all? Are you all still hearing me? Okay. Yes, we are. Oh, good. Okay, um, and it's some good news. The good news is this. We have all the proven policy instruments and all the new technologies to stop technologies to stop climate destruction starting now. And before I tell you what today's solutions are, I just want you to recall what our US EPA has accomplished. And it really, I think, began in 1972 uh, when we saved the American Eagle from extinction by pesticides, uh, you you all, I'm sure many of you will remember Rachel Carson, who in 1962 wrote Silent Spring, a great book that woke up America uh, to the dangers of pesticides. Um, in the uh, 1980s, using cap and trade, we took the lead out of gasoline that was causing brain damage in urban babies. Um, in the 1980s, we stopped toxic waste dumping. I'm sure you all remember Love Canal, and there were thousands of more horrific toxic waste dump sites created by our biggest and finest corporations, many household names. Well, EPA stopped that in the 1980s, and uh, that was really what took me to EPA to, was to join that effort. I was so upset by toxic waste dumping in the 70s. Uh, in the 1990s, we cleaned up much water and air pollution uh, by then, and and particularly for uh, you all remember, may remember acid rain from power plants. Uh, it was not only in, in the northern latitudes of America and into Canada, but it was also in Germany and Europe. They, they called it Volstead and Forest stuff in Germany. Uh, well, cap and trade used used by EPA to to stop to stop acid rain. The last great success I want to mention, which is the most important that we need to remember above all, is that conservatives, Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, and Ronald Reagan saved us from being fried by ultraviolet radiation. Um, they listened to the scientists and in 1987 uh, signed the Montreal Protocol, the treaty that outlawed the man-made chemicals that were causing stratospheric ozone holes. Now, we're still suffering too much skin cancer and too many cataracts from UV radiation, but this treaty is restoring the natural the stratospheric ozone shield that protects us from excess solar radiation. And if, we, if they hadn't done that, I, a lot of us would be really fried by now. Uh, so... I think that is the greatest environmental success our planet has seen globally. Uh, it's, it's a model for a climate change treaty. And the only thing I can think that exceeds the Montreal Protocol as a treaty is the 1960s ban on atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons, which I don't even think the North Koreans have violated. Well, uh, so to EPA and people like me and, and Tim Whitehouse, uh, who work there with me, uh, climate change is just another air pollution problem, like so many that EPA has resolved since 1970. And EPA's policy success is reducing air pollution at the ground level from, you know, vehicular smog and whatnot. And in the stratosphere, uh, can easily be replicated in between in the troposphere to save the climate. Uh, now, after my talk, if there's a question and time for it, um, because we did start so late. I won't tell you now, but if you want to ask me, I will explain how cap and trade works. And I also should tell you that there's a new policy instrument called carbon fee and dividend uh, that I think is what we really need going forward. Uh, both are free market-based policy instruments that can save the climate. Okay, uh, that was 
policies. The second part of your last and fourth and last takeaway is to conclude with the good news that in addition to the policies that are tried and true, uh, we have invented and perfected the new technologies to stop climate destruction starting now. And the three most important technologies are wind and solar. We know these as renewables. I'm not going to describe those because they're familiar to us. And nuclear power. Yes, you did hear me say nuclear power. And this is the important part of your final takeaway. Now, perhaps you remember Jane Fonda's movie, The China Syndrome, that came out just before the failure at Three Mile Island Platt in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, this was the primitive reactor that, because of the movie, frightened us, frightened us all hysterically. But the truth is that at uh, Three Mile Island, uh, there was no measurable health effect. Nobody was killed, and it could not have exploded. Uh, at Fukushima, the radiation killed nobody, and there's very little contamination in the area today. The, the only really bad episode was Chernobyl, which killed a few people. But each year, the local air pollution from coal burning kills about a million people around the world for every one person ever killed by a nuclear power plant. And there's no question that coal is the most dangerous and nuclear power is the most safe way to make electricity. There's just no question about that. And it's even getting better because uh, while the primitive uh, light water reactors commercialized 50 years ago, like the three I've named, do need to be retired, we have to stop freaking out about nuclear power. Uh, the modern and the so-called fourth generation nuclear reactors cannot melt down, cannot be used to make nuclear weapons, and they will also amazingly use as fuel and eliminate the barely used nuclear waste stored in pools around today's primitive reactors. Uh, the, you can look these up as they might be called molten salt reactors or thorium reactors or integral fast reactors. And fortunately, uh, Bill Gates and um, China, South Korea, maybe Russia, and a few other very smart people are investing in them. And uh, they're, the latest and most exciting thing is that they're going to be building small modular reactors uh, called s'mores. I'm not talking about the Girl Scout cookies called s'mores, but small modular reactors, SMRs. And they're going to be building them in shipyards. And these new reactors will be like big refrigerators. And they just ship out as many as you want. You, you line them up two, four, six, twenty 20 in a row, plug them in. And you've got nuclear power almost anywhere. <coughs> Excuse my cough. I'm going to uh, do a Marco Rubio and drink a little water here. Hold on a second. Uh, okay. So if you have a question about where these will be made, we can talk about that. And here's my final book recommendation. The name is, and it's on your list, A Bright Future, How Some Countries Have Solved Climate Change, and the Rest Can Follow, by Joshua Goldstein and Staffan A. Kvist, Q-V-I-S-T, Q-V-I-S-T. Um, and judging from his name, well, I know the book is mostly about Sweden, and I suppose he may be Swedish. Well, all right, so those are your four takeaways from my book. Uh, I shortened my talk because of my uh, failures to... Uh, be able to get on to see you all in a timely way. Uh, I will just say that it's uh, it's the perfect book for you to buy for your, your green young person in your family, and uh, uh, they would enjoy the adventure stories mixed with environmental science. And and despite the uh, dismal science, personally at age 79, I'm feeling very young and very optimistic. I wouldn't be talking with you now if I did not think that Florida could do much better. Um, and uh, we should be looking at the uh, citizens, excuse me, the uh, uh, bill before Congress called the uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, uh, principally based uh, on a, the carbon fee and dividend proposal that Citizens Climate Lobby, above all, supports. Um, and it was introduced in uh, 
2018 and again in 2019, and I'm sure again next year by Ted Deutsch, our congressman, uh, and also Florida Congressman Charlie Crist, and a Republican Florida Congressman Francis Rooney. So we have elected some Florida leaders who know what to do. Uh, now, I'm one minute from finishing here. I confess I like poetry. And there's some poems in my book, along with a lot of history, economics, policy, technology, science, and a whole lot of, whole lot of adventure. Uh, but I want to read to you a poem that was written in 1845, really to oppose the Mexican War when the U.S. invaded Mexico. Uh, but it was adopted by the abolitionists trying to end slavery. It's also a verse in a Protestant hymn, and here it's entitled Once to Every Man and Nation. Let me read it to you slowly, and then I'll let you ask your questions. Here's the hymn and poem. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth and falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause, some great decision, offering each the bloom or blight, and the choice goes by forever, twixt that darkness and that light. Well, now if everybody's exhausted, we can just say good evening, but um, <laughs> I hope there's some discussion or questions, and I'll turn the phone uh, management over to Monica. Okay. Thank this you. Is, this is Stephanie. Um, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Um, we have a question about nuclear power. Uh, of course, you were just talking about that. And here in South Florida, of course, we have an issue with the uh, coast shrinking and saltwater intrusion and and the integrity of the land. Do you think that, that nuclear power is really doable in South Florida? Well, I have uh, two good things I could say about Florida Power and Light and three bad things. And one of the bad things is what they're proposing at nuclear, uh, at the Turkey Point nuclear plant south of Miami. and we already know that the existing reactors have caused cooling water pollution problems, threatening the drinking water in Miami and the Keys. Uh, they've gotten licensing for two more reactors there. I don't know what design they'll be. I assume they're just going to be more of the same primitive light water reactors. <laughs> but really, I mean, this plant is practically in the ocean anyway. It's very susceptible to uh, not just a sea level rise, but to a, a, a horrific hurricane. And I can't imagine that anybody would add any more nuclear power in such a place. Um, I, I think there, there are, it is higher ground in Florida to the north where uh, an advanced nuclear reactor could very well go. Okay, and uh, talking about FPNL, you said you were hoping someone would ask about FPNL. So there, <laughs> I'll ask about FPNL um, only because um, we seem to get mixed messages. Um, we're not sure where they're at. Uh, I don't know if you have any insight as to uh, uh, you know the things, the different things that they're doing, and are they counteracting each other? Well, I mentioned one bad thing they're doing, which is expanding Turkey Point. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me mention two good things, and I'll give you two more bad things. This is my list, at least. Every, you probably have your own list, but <laughs> my list is, I think it's great they're building these vast solar arrays to handle the air conditioning baseload demand that's highest at midday. Uh, I think that's great. Um, and I think it's great that they've hardened the grid against hurricanes, you know, and at least where I live, we've seen them replace all the wooden poles with very heavy uh, concrete, I guess concrete and steel poles. Uh, but the bad things they're doing are uh, they're, uh, they oppose uh, rooftop solar that's non-residential. They, they 
can't prohibit not they can't prohibit residential solar, and I have it on my house, but they oppose customer owned uh, uh, solar uh, owned by other businesses that Florida Power does not own and monopolize. And so Walmart and other companies that might like to do it can't put up rooftop solar. Um, and they're also bringing in uh, natural gas. It's climate killing and Florida flooding. And it, Florida Power Light is participating in the suicide pact to speed the drowning of Florida. I can't believe that Florida Power and its parent next era energy are ignorant of the horrific climate killing dangers of natural gas uh, or ignorant of the climate friendliness of advanced nuclear power. I just can't believe it. Uh, it seems to me, and this is an old expression, but it seems to me that Florida power lines management is just whistling past the graveyard and you whistle past the graveyard intentionally. And only thing I can say is that these managers are maximizing their short term profits and getting ready to cash out before the stockholders investments go under the sea. Uh, so that's pretty harsh, but that's what I think of Fuller Power and Light. Okay. Um, uh, someone's asking if uh, you think it'd be more effective to lobby for changes at the state or national level. Well, I think we got to do it everywhere. The, the Southeast Florida Regional Compact, as you all know, it's got Broward County and uh, Palm Beach, Miami Dade, and Monroe County. It's a good start. Uh, and I think that began at a time when, under Governor Scott, it could be a firing offense for a state employee to mention climate change. <laughs> so the, the Regional Action Plan here at the local level has many goals and strategies, but, but they're not enough to prevent what's coming. Uh, the counties can't stop Florida power and light that's speeding and drowning of Florida, and, and they can't take on the uh, the, the national uh, uh, achieve the national legislation and the international cooperation that is required because you know these climate killing chemicals are globally dispersed all around and affecting every every place in the world. This is a global issue. That's why I talk about it globally. But I do think we have to you know walk the talk locally as much as we can. Okay. Um, someone is asking uh, about the Gulf Stream off of Florida's coast. Is there a possibility of harvesting ocean energy for power? You know, there, there have been some efforts in that way uh, in Scotland, and I think there was one in Maine, and um, I, I, think, I think it's worth looking into, but, uh, you know, truthfully, I think that, uh, you know, hydro, uh, hydrothermal, excuse me, geothermal, uh, hydroelectric, ocean energy, they're all, they're all good, but they're not going to produce enough to solve the problem. They're, they're, they're interesting, helpful sideshows. Uh, and, uh, that's not to say they shouldn't be explored, but, uh, I keep coming back to uh, wind and solar and to manage the base load when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing is, is advanced nuclear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have another, we have a question about, um, well, you mentioned uh, HR 763, that um, uh, carbon dividend uh, bill that's in, in sponsored by uh, Deutsch. Um, yeah. Do you, um, can you say something about the advantages of having a bipartisan uh, climate legislation um, such as that over just one party trying to put forth something? Well, uh, for sure. And uh, what's, what's so interesting to me, and, and I'm trying to find a page in my book because I, I might need to refer to something here, but uh, you know, this whole idea of carbon fee and dividend is, is, not, is not a radical idea. And it's uh, supported by many, many conservatives. Uh, and it's, uh, and I'll tell you who some of them are, because you'll know their names, James Baker, uh, Henry Paulson, who was, uh, 
young, young George Bush's secretary of the treasury is very much a conservationist, George Schultz, uh, two uh, conservative economists who were head of the uh, Council on Economic Advisors, Martin Felstein, uh, Greg Mankiw, uh, the, the Rob Walton of Walmart. There's a long list, of, it's a growing list of, of, of business members and conservative leaders who favor this uh, carbon fee and dividend uh, approach. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's good to have slogans sometimes, and I'd like to offer you a couple of slogans. You know, with this COVID thing, a good slogan I heard recently is mask it or casket. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I hope you all heard that. Uh, casket if you don't mask it. Uh, the slogan for a carbon fee and dividend is, is, is very simple too. It's tax the bads to free the goods. And, you know, we do this with so many things already. Uh, Look at the uh, look at this is not radical socialism. Uh, we we tax alcoholic beverages, we tax cigarettes, things that we allow but want to suppress. Uh, the state lottery has uh, is now run uh, by the government for tax reasons and not by a bunch of criminals. Uh, the state lottery took it over and drove out the criminals. Marijuana now is coming onto this list. So to tax the bads to free the goods. Uh, what are the goods that are free? The goods that are free is that the uh, uh, carbon fee and rebate uh, collect tax will be rebated 100% to the uh, citizens who can then then go out and buy electric vehicles and put solar panels on their house. Uh, so it's, it's a twofer. Um, and, uh, and it's a free market-based mechanism, which is why the conservatives like it, because everybody gets to decide, well, do I... Do I pay the tax or do I so I don't want to pay the tax, but I want to do uh, buy a car that doesn't require me to pay the tax. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's so simple. Tax the, tax the bads to free the goods. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, a question here about, and I know in your book you talk about uh, the criminal sanctions for companies. Uh, they're asking about civil, are there civil or criminal sanctions for companies that grossly, grossly, excuse me, and recklessly ignore the environmental risks? Uh, have they been held criminally liable for reckless disregard to life when there is environmental harm that results from their actions or inactions? Well, uh, I, I think like any uh, federal agency with enforcement authority, the EPA has the full range of sanctions. You know, we have administrative law. Uh, the agencies, including EPA, even have their own administrative law judges, and they can impose multi-million dollar fines, but they can't put somebody in prison. Uh, if you need an injunction to stop ongoing bad behavior, you have to go to the U.S. court system in a civil case. And if it's a criminal matter, which is basically... It could be the same same behavior, but done uh, with intent and where you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And even though a dead body count isn't necessary, uh, where we have a dead body count, and that could be p fish and birds as well as people, uh, EPA would usually take that case criminally. Uh, the, the problem that made me a whistleblower and that we're seeing today with Bill Barr again is that the Justice Department only uh, uh, makes the corporation pay a fine and doesn't charge the responsible corporate officers. It's the same thing we saw with Eric Holder after the uh, collapse of the banks in 2008. Uh, no bank officers were imprisoned. Uh, and this is, this is a perversion of our Justice Department. And those of you who remember the 1980s may remember the savings and loan disaster, which was handled by the states, and the state attorneys general put hundreds of uh, savings and loan bank executives in prison. Uh, so uh, we have the full range of, of tools, but uh, right now they're not. And, and when, when I was there at, at the end of my time as, as uh, lead advisor for criminal investigations, uh, responsible corporate officers were not being held criminally responsible. That's a terrible thing that needs to be corrected. Okay. 
Um, if we have a change of administration uh, in January of 2021, beyond rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, what would you have the new administration and the EPA do immediately? Um, well, of course, we need to have legislation to address climate change. And uh, all the all the existing uh, rules and regulations that uh, the present administration has put in hold, uh, most of them still remain on the books, and they can just pop right up again and start to be used again. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it, fatal damage has not been done to EPA. All the, most of the authorities are still there. You probably know that uh, the Sierra Club's former legal defense fund now called Earth Justice and another uh, group called the Natural Resources Defense Council have regularly been suing and winning uh, at, uh, the, against uh, the efforts by the current administration to uh, to um, roll back and and destroy EPA's regulations. And the reason is that regulation is based on peer-reviewed science, and you even the courts have held that you cannot repeal a, a, on a political whim a peer-reviewed science based regulation if the science hasn't changed. So all the regulations and the statutes all remain in place. So EPA will pop right up again, but it's going to, you know, it's going to have to have new leadership and uh, a lot of retraining and a lot of good people have left, just like have left the State Department. And it's, it's, it's going to be, a, it's gonna be a, 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 a standing it up again, reconstructing it, uh, dusting off the existing authorities, which remain, have remained sitting on the shelf and and uh, taking on climate change as a new endeavor with new legislation. Um, okay, uh, some uh, questions here about educating the public. One question is about how do you educate young students, younger students about the threats and how do you educate about the connection between plastics and greenhouse gases? Um, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you educate people? I know you talked in your book about a, um, supporting the spiritual awakening of the younger generation. Do you have any I ideas about how to go about that? Well, I, I think, I think <laughs> everybody kind of needs to do their own thing. You know, my, my thing was criminal enforcement of EPA's core laws. And um, and then and then I did a lot of teaching over. I actually worked 17 years in foreign assistance, teaching other countries uh, how to have EPAs. Because it, in my time, the U.S. government was admired as having the biggest and best EPA in the world, and other countries wanted to uh, have us teach them how to do it. Well, now of course we're now a laughing stock. But um, so I, I have done some teaching, but you know, uh, I, the 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 there's so many things that I just could not address in my book, and, I, and frankly, I do not address plastics. I really can't talk about the oceans because most of my work was land-based. Uh, of course, everything flows to the sea eventually anyway, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I, I talk mostly about clean water, clean air, and uh, toxic waste and uh, uh, dangerous chemicals and pesticides. That, that's That's been my... Uh, experience so if if you're if you're a teacher at the um, you know elementary or high school level uh, great I, I taught at the college level my book is is directed at the college level um, but it doesn't cover it doesn't cover the waterfront it doesn't cover natural resource protection or the oceans or plastics in particular but but all these things are important okay um, let's see one question here about uh, going back to carbon fee and dividend again, um, trying yeah. to understand the incentive for industries under that type of proposal. If the individuals are getting the dividends, what incentive, uh, you know, what are the incentives there? Well, of course, there's no incentive for the fossil fuel based industries that will fight this tooth and claw to the bitter end. Uh, and and have done so 
uh, for decades uh, already uh, uh, stymieing efforts to address climate change. Uh, so it's going to be a terribly tough battle. Uh, but on the other hand, you have uh, new industries uh, that will take the place of the old industries, and they're predominantly wind, solar, and nuclear. And uh, all the infrastructure rebuilding that will uh, that 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 will require. Uh, we could also mention hydrogen. Uh, Japan and Germany are are going heavily into hydrogen uh, fuels, and uh, the advantage of hydrogen is that it can be well. Hydrogen can be wonderful if you have the right right places for it because it's it can be completely free of combustion from production to use on the road. You know, if you use a wind turbine to hydrolytically split water into uh, and take out the hydrogen, and then you can store it, which you can't do for electricity, and, and you put it in a car or a bus, and uh, what comes out the tailpipe is water uh, as, as the hydrogen and oxygen recombine again. Uh, totally, totally combustion-free, climate-friendly uh, energy from production to consumption on the road. Uh, so the, the, the new technologies and the infrastructure to manage them uh, could be a tremendous infrastructure projects. I would hope the labor unions would, would see that. I think they would. But uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a fight to the death battle because mm-hmm. it will mean the death of fossil and fossil fuel industries. Right. Uh, there's another question here regarding the cap and trade. Uh, you had mentioned uh, taking the lead out of gasoline as a cap and trade example. Um, yeah. How how did that work? I mean, why was that a cap and trade example? Well, uh, well, I probably I probably ought to briefly explain how cap and trade works. So imagine you have two two uh, uh, let's say uh, oil refineries uh, making gasoline. Okay, and uh, one is uh, one is uh, doing it the right way, and as and one is doing it the wrong way. Uh, so. Or it could be two power plants. One is polluting the air and one is not. Uh, The way cap and trade works is that uh, the EPA sets a cap on the amount of lead that can be in gasoline or the amount of uh, sulfur dioxide that can be in in emissions from from power plants causing acid rain, because we did it there too, and and, uh, requires uh, uh, and and issues permits for up up to that limit. And over time, reduces the limit uh, and reduces the cap. And facilities that are still making the old, uh, making the old leaded fuel or making uh, making the air dirty with with the sulfur, have to have permits and they have to buy them. And the the uh, the, uh, the plants that will sell it to them are the ones that don't need them and don't need it anymore because they've upgraded. So. Why industry likes this is that the plants that quickly go to clean fuels and energy energy production, uh, perhaps because they they'd already fully depreciated their old equipment, they were ready to upgrade anyway, can sell their unused uh, uh, pollution permits to the dirty plants, and they can continue uh, uh, and have the flexibility until they've fully depreciated their equipment or, or and and uh, switch to the clean. Uh, Clean fuels too. Uh, so that's why industry liked it. It wasn't a, you know do it do it do it next year by everybody do it next year by January one or else. You know that's command and control. Cap and trade gave the industries time to uh, switch depending on the status of, of each plant's equipment and uh, operations. Now we probably don't have time to do that anymore because industry has stonewalled for so many decades that we're probably going to have to go to the uh, carbon fee and dividend. Um, uh, even though industry industry liked cap and trade, it, cap and trade was actually suggested DPA, I think, by the Heritage Foundation in the 70s. It's it's another conservative, market based approach because the permits are tradable. They like it. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I don't know if anybody else has any more questions. Um, we can, unless there's some other further points you would like to make, uh, Richard, um, we could consider. Uh, closing the meeting. Is anyone, if anyone has any other questions to put in the chat, if not, is there any 
Anything else you want to add? No, I don't want to add anything except it's it's been uh, wonderfully uh, 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 uplifting to uh, get in touch with you, good people, and to know that others share my interests. And uh, I, I really uh, I really enjoyed this session. And if anybody sends any uh, questions to me, I'll be happy to answer them. And uh, I hope that I might even see your faces someday. <laughs> Well, I, I, we really, really appreciate you uh, doing this and persevering mm -hmm. with trying to uh, get on board with the meeting. And um, uh, we just want to thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everybody who, who uh, joined us and uh, also persevered through the little hiccups we had at the beginning. So um, nice. we, will, uh, we will be following up with emails and we'll... Uh, include uh, your your book again uh, in there, and uh, we hope to stay in touch. So we uh, thank you very much. Well, God bless everybody, and uh, let's hope for uh, a, a safe. Uh, I'm leaving. I'm leaving Saturday to go to my home in the north, and let's hope for a, a safe and healthy fall and summer. And uh, that, uh, maybe I'll meet you all next winter. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you.